We're going to get going with uh, the sabbatical times. Um, it sounds like a novel from the 50s. <laughs> it sounds like something that Truman Capote <laughs> would write. <laughs> something bad happens in the sabbatical times. Um, I, I want to be very, very brief for, for many reasons. Maybe once, because uh, uh, Andrew, I think, speaks to all of us with regular, uh, on a regular basis to the symposiums and so on. But I just want to mention, since we did a goodbye party on the symposium, uh, which many people took seriously, uh, I want to make officially this is a welcome back party uh, to, for Andrew Sago back to the faculty in Tyre. Um, uh, unfortunately, also with the political times, I think there were some concerns about everything. So uh, it's good to know that he's back. Um, but uh, when I was, uh, you have to make it very, very simple. Um, there was this, this quote of John Orber where I thought it was super interesting, which is, I always heard that you needed to give yourself a long time to unplug when you're doing a sabbatical. Unplug it so fast I was a little concerned and I was losing brain capacity. Um, uh, Andrew, when, when took the sabbatical for other things, um, in, in Saya we, we, we do only like four months sabbaticals, unlike other institutions that do one or two years, because we are worried about this. And we are worried that they, they will lose brain capacity and so on. So four months, enough, come back, let's check to make sure that everything is working. Um, but we, we talk about informally, and this actually is the first one that it, well, it will, I think, it will, I hope it becomes a tradition, which faculty who take sabbaticals or for different reasons need to work in projects or things and so on, and when that, that period is over and they come back to teach and so on, they come and share with their colleagues and the students. This is not really a lecture. It's more like an informal conversation. It's for Andrew to, to talk a little bit what he's been working for this time. Because I think if, he's, if these things are put in the right context with the right, argument, the right arguments, it should be a part of the enrichment of the conversation that faculty have with other colleagues and with the students. It's supposed to be, and when you take a sabbatical, it's because you're reflecting or working or reanalyzing or rebooting or relaunching ideas or exploring or because you're working on a book or an exhibition or different things. Um, so I think it's an, important, it's an important tradition I think we are starting today. Uh, which I think it will happen with others, but I, I don't think it's that different than when we did the conversation with Peter Testa about the book or when we do the conversations in the exhibition. I think these are more opportunities for us uh, almost internally uh, as a community of, of people who are thinking and speculating to talk about this and sometimes to uncover or open the curtains of certain things that each of us, we work in our offices and so on. So it's, it's in that spirit that this conversation will happen. So please join me to welcome back Andrew Sago. Alive and well. I, just feel like I have to find my notes. <laughs> yes, I need that. Of course, as David was saying to, uh, earlier, what I did on my summer vacation, here's my, um, it's funny. The, the th and, and I want to uh, thank you for the introduction and just for all of my colleagues that are taking sabbaticals, I'm going to do them a favor of setting the bar really low on what I'm presenting so that you won't feel that you have to rise to any uh, occasion. Um, it's funny. Uh, teaching uh, as long as I have been, and even before coming here, various other positions, it's been a long, long time since I've taken time without teaching, um, other than when I had an accident, which is <laughs> you know, not a good way to get a break, trust me. Um, but I remember coming back and the first thing I ran into John Enright and I said, John, I gotta tell you, I am simultaneously so deeply appreciative of CyArk for giving me this time off and so deeply resentful <laughs> at having to be back here. It's a very strange mix of emotions, I must tell you. Um, but I wanna say, so I'm here and, and I guess I've kicked off a, a, a series. The only reason you're all here is it, it's sort of my fault. <coughs> Uh, I think Ryan Martinez, I was just telling him, he was giving a, a little, one of these little lunchtime faculty talks downstairs, which is mostly faculty, a few interested students, it's at lunch. And I came in because for a number of reasons, among them that Ryan did me a, an enormous uh, favor and a big deadline, it was the least I could do. So it was one of my breaks from the sabbatical. And I leaned over to Hernan and said, I wanna do a lunchtime talk. I'd like to just come in and just talk, kind of closed door. And he said, well, do a, we'll do an evening lecture, we'll do it in CAC. So this is the 
compromise. It's not a big lecture, but it is really intended. So, you know, um, it's not a lecture, as Hernan said. I don't exactly have an end other than a kind of the end slide. And it's really intended as a conversation among sort of SIAR colleagues. So if the rest of you get bored with this, don't, it's fine if you want to leave. Because this is, you know, I want to just make sure you know what it is. At the same time, uh, if, uh, let me go forward here. Field notes. So it is a little bit like, you know, what, let's say, yeah, notes from the field, mostly what I did. Uh, if there's time and it seems to make sense, I'll, I'll um, share some other observations with you. I'm, I'm, as you all know, I'm always uh, more than willing to uh, <laughs> offer my observations and pronouncements on, on, on most anything, whether I'm qualified to do so or not. Uh, it is, uh, if this is not only unscripted, but slightly uh, anecdotal, maybe even occasionally personal, you know, forgive me, it's not, it's nothing I would ever think is tolerable within the context of a, of a lecture, but I, I tried to format this uh, differently. I mean, you'll see uh, virtually everything I'm, I'm showing. I'm not really presenting any work uh, whatsoever. A few, there's was quite a few images, but they're almost all things that I just shot with my iPhone uh, around the office as kind of, um, just so I didn't feel quite so um, naked up here um, uh, talking without having visuals. Um, so the so the sabbatical, you know, as, as Hernan mentions, is a, a very interesting um, time for reflection. Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, this, I guess, a publication effort that I'm I'm working on. Uh, but just a little bit of, you know, in addition to that, also in the last few months, I've been working on a number of other projects. There would be, I suppose, another occasion where I could talk about that, but a couple of uh, different housing projects in, in Mexico, uh, one of which is, is, as I understand it, under construction right now. A number of my colleagues here uh, are involved in, in this as well. Another one whose design is finishing up uh, a very small project in, in Iran. Uh, and then the conclusion of um, um, an invited project that I did, uh, my office did about a year ago. In, in, um, for the U University of Illinois in Chicago, but it ended up being a, a very large uh, and complex installation at the last Chicago uh, Biennial. So we've been busy with this. Um, but the other thing is, uh, it was an occasion, I suppose, let's see if I, oh. Oh, damn. Hang on, I screwed up my slide. This is, <laughs> it's as informal. I actually have a picture of, uh, this is from uh, A Beautiful Mind, when the scientist goes insane and he thinks he's actually made a great breakthrough. There's a picture of my office with every, I can, God damn it, I can do this. I know what I did. There it is. I pasted it on top instead of in a new image. This is my version. It's a little more orderly than, what was his name, Adams, the, the, the fellow who, the scientist who goes insane in a beautiful mind. Um, but really it was, a, the, the, one of the main things that we did was, uh, you know, the thought was to do a book, was to do a monog ar architectural monograph on our work, and, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit uh, at length. But before doing that, and really what a lot of the actual labor of the, the, the uh, semester off was actually just figuring out what the hell I've actually done. And uh, so I, didn't, I couldn't actually picture it all. I didn't know how to make a kind of criteria of what would belong in it, what wouldn't belong in it. And so we made this, you know, took over this main wall in uh, our office and made this very long timeline. Uh, and this timeline, it goes from actually uh, from 1983 to 2018, so however many years that is, a lot, I guess. Um, and um, it covers a lot of periods. It covers some juvenilia uh, that I'll, I'll talk about, things that 83 to 86 was, you know, I guess after, uh, when I was in graduate school, after I started working with Baram Sherdell, who was uh, my teacher uh, at the time and later became uh, my partner in a, in a partnership here. Uh, Juvenalia, I think there's two or three examples of work there that I'm going to put forward as, as being things that are part of my, uh, my, the body of work. 
uh, immediately within weeks of that concluding, uh, coming out here to Los Angeles and, and working at Morphosis for the, a brief period, but to execute the Sixth Street House drawings. Uh, and then right on the heels of that, going into partnership uh, as first as Oxruno together with uh, Baram Shardell, initially with a couple of other people, but essentially Baram and I, and then that morphed into uh, Shardell Zago Kipnis. Um, it was both relatively short-lived, but, but sort of important practices. Uh, and then it goes into other periods. I, I left here to go to Cornell University. Uh, I taught there for a couple of years. I finished my first built work while I was there. Uh, after Cornell, on my way back, always intending to come back to LA and back to, it was all, I was also teaching at CyArk uh, at the time as a young man, uh, you know, the, the age of a lot of your, you here that are graduate students, uh, left for a long time, first going to Cornell, uh, and then my long detour on my way back here, I ended up in Detroit, which is where I'm from, where my partner Laura Bauman is also from, uh, and having a practice there in Detroit for a number of years. Uh, and then while I did other things like go and start a graduate program at, at the City College of New York, I maintained a Detroit practice as, as a significant chapter in, in my professional career for about 10 years uh, until I transitioned back here. And I, I, I came here as by accident uh, the semester. Neil had brought me back here to CyArk the semester. When I arrived, he had just stepped down. Um, um, Ray Cappy stepped back in temporarily as the as the acting chair, and it was the semester that Eric came in to, to um, uh, take over as director. Ming Fung started then as well, and, and Chris Kennick. Uh, really, when I got to know uh, everybody again, a few years after that, I closed my practice in Detroit and came back out here. I think it's been about ten years now. So this is you know this this is the kind of arc that, uh, aside from again some some juvenile work, let's say, there was really uh, an early period in Los Angeles, uh, a little wandering in the desert, a, a period in Detroit, and then a period back here in Los Angeles. And, and um, so this is, this is sort of everything, and I'm, I'm, it's a very complicated thing to try to go through, going through and looking at this and trying to figure out what the hell I have and haven't done, what qualifies as a project. For any of you who, who know me, uh, it's very strange, you know, we're notoriously underpublished. When I say we, I say myself personally, a past partnership, my current partnership since at least 2013 with, with Laura Bauman. Uh, we're notorious about being underpublished. A lot of this work that I'm going through has seen the light in a publication here or there, which you know everyone you know promptly becomes hard to find, or it's a lecture here and there. You know, I like to think because of its rarity, we're a little bit like a kind of cult band. Everyone thinks it's really good, <laughs> so well, I may, I may just now. I'm going to set out to see whether I can prove or disprove that, and I, that that's what remains to be seen. But what I wanted to say is, uh, um, this was a period of, is an intense period here in my my teaching here at CyArk. I, I retired, and then really Hernan convinced me to come back out of retirement, and <laughs> here I am again. But what I wanted to say was. Um, this point, I thought, for me is very important. All of these things I'm going to be showing is about kind of closing uh, a series of chapters and trying to kind of put it out there into the world, but also in a way putting it behind me. Uh, I think really what I'm looking forward to, and this is maybe uh, it, easy to say, but I, I suppose if I say it out loud in front of people, I commit to it. I mean, we're really, you know, we, we consider ourselves, in spite of how much I teach, as, as a practicing architect first and foremost, and, and an academic second. Uh, this is really, I think, we, all, we feel like this is the time to build. And so let's see if the economy holds out, and my luck holds out, uh, and I don't fire my clients. Uh, maybe it'll actually happen. Anyways, this is the timeline. This is year by year going all the way through with a few other footnotes thrown in here and there. The whole other work of this, and uh, I see Carolina Mercia is here. Uh, this is her work, uh, largely. But this was something that we finally finished up uh, this September, which is going through various storage locations in, in other cities, uh, bringing them all together into, into one place, opening up these dusty old boxes, things that you know sometimes literally hasn't been seen in decades, at least photographing them like um, forensic evidence, putting them in archival boxes, and neatly arranging them in, in our storage space in the office. It's very funny. So finally we decided, how many things do I have that I think is worth uh, publishing? 
And uh, it's 101 is what we decided. We, we, I, I only work in prime, I try to only work in prime numbers bigger than five. 101 is certainly one. I don't like the symmetry of it. Seems almost like it ought not to belong to the prime number club. Nonetheless, it does. But sometimes it's funny. So this is not projects, and it's not even major works, which is a few dozen, let's say. But it would be things that somehow I thought should see the light of day, sometimes studies, sometimes uh, boards and other things that were prepared, sometimes texts. Uh, so then you come across this, and this is designing a very special base for a model. And so these are models of models for a base of a model. And we're like, does this actually? <laughs> It actually made the, the cut, and I'll, I'll argue for it, but this is things you discover in, when, you, when you go through too many boxes. Uh, and so uh, the thought was that we're going to do a monograph, and, and I wrote a couple of things. I'm not going to read more than a sentence here or there. Uh, when, so when I drop the microphone, you can hear absolutely nothing. Is that right? Excellent. I'll try not to, but I, have, I brought props, so I'll, um, I'll, just, I'll just tuck it. I think. <laughs> See, Stephanie, this works fine. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. You know, so, you know, first off, I was joking in, in my proposal for the sabbatical that, you know, just as, you know, the, the first off, we have an obscene amount of stuff that hasn't been, been published or not published enough. Just in time, coming to the party, just as the monograph, you know, we decided suddenly not such an interesting form anymore. Is the book dead? We can d discuss that. I'll, I'll argue against that. But certainly, the 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 book that is the 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 thing that you look to and there's everything for someone's career seemed a little besides the point right now, and at the same time, a horrible model for me. And so, I'm looking at this both. I, I think I made a kind of three pronged argument for it. One was practical, which I just made. The second one was, if not let's say personal, that there was a form that we started thinking through that seemed to make sense with our work, and I'll talk about that. And then the third one was maybe this was in this, if we are in a state when, when the, the, the monograph or the big old book is, is in danger, that maybe um, anyone that's trying to look at different models, uh, maybe in a kind of shop talk way, these, these, some of these things can be, does this actually working? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, immediately, like, what, what would be my ideal of the monograph? You know, this would be it. Guarino Guarini's Architettura Civile or the Big Ledoux, you know? And I'm thinking, well, even were these possible, even were they possible, you know, the idea of having some amazing codified system of geometry that would explain the intricacies of your ar architectural form, I don't have that, and it's not clear that any one person would be able or ought to be able to put together this, you know, maybe Patrick Schumacher, you know, heaven forbid, you know, this would be, it doesn't, it doesn't ring, it doesn't have the same compelling, you know, ring of either authenticity or at least desirability maybe that it did uh, at once. And then certainly with Ledoux, the idea that one would have a kind of epic sweep of projects that still had a kind of uh, single-minded intensity and rigor certainly doesn't characterize our work. And so I thought, well, I can't do those. That's out. Uh, you know, probably, th this is a, a small book. I'm, so I'm going to just, and I have them, so I brought my props. I didn't bring the Ledoux. That's a beautiful book, by the way. Uh, you know, the uh, Jesse and Nanico. So these are, this is not, I'm not a, a scholar of the book or the scholar of the monograph. This is really, like I say, these are photographs taken um, just on, on the desk as we're working and putting these things together. But uh, Jesse and Nanico's uh, Atlas of Novel Tectonics, I love. You know, I mean, I suppose if, if there could be a Guarini book, you know, of today, this would be it. They go through and kind of nerdily and dutifully explain all of their diagrams and justifications for it, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I, I don't think I would have that kind of, uh, be able to do that kind of comprehensive overview. I think not. Uh, but I, I certainly always look at this uh, as one model. You know, this is more like it. Um, I, so it's funny. So I show Stanley Tigerman, people start laughing. That's either, that's either two GB students who wonder why we keep talking about Stanley Tigerman all the time, or people who just think this is like, this is the, 
a height of a certain era of monographs and, and represents like everything that I hate and worry about with a monograph, which is, um, you know, that there is a single style, in this case it's a kind of horrific design, but there's a single kind of style and it homogenizes every single thing that's put in there. And not only that, you can't differentiate amongst them. Uh, you have to show them, and, and so, so I don't know. Look, I'm a complete novice at this. I don't know why it comes out like this. Stanley Tigerman is actually someone that I have a uh, super high regard for. But I, you know, I, I, I picked this up recently, and I, I, it, it's, it's almost toxic in its design. And so you have projects like this, which are the kind of infill. Um, and the problem is, then you have things like this frog hollow barn. I don't know if any of you have known this. We've been, because of studio in part, we've been going deep into Tigerman's work. Uh, there's an amazing afterword in here by John Haydick that I, I strongly recommend you read. I hadn't read before. He kind of dissects the body of work beautifully and, and sh in a shockingly frank way to be included in the monograph, actually. Uh, but, the, you know, nothing in there. Uh, in the same format, suddenly you steamroll or everything including this extremely enigmatic and powerful black barn hovering at the edge of a lake with white swans, apparently, you know? So it does, it does a kind of violence to the subtlety of the work to, to sometimes cram it into a certain monograph format. And I, I thought, well, good thing I waited because I don't, <laughs> good thing no one does those anymore. Uh, or, or, for instance, uh, his Formica showroom. This, I don't know if any of you know this project. This is, this is, the, this is the project that when I, I, I met him not so long ago that we bonded over. Um, and then, you know, then some, there, is, there is the other model, of course, which is uh, the, the overkill. So we know this. Uh, e everyone knows this. This is, uh, I, I was joking. So it turns out David Eskenazi does his laundry right next to my office. And so he comes by on a, every Saturday, I want to tell you, he does, comes, <laughs> comes by, knocks on the door, we chat. So this, this is actually, he knows this, this is a running conversation we've been having for, uh, for a number of weeks. So that's my, my um, interaction with Cyark over my sabbatical has been, uh, it, it tells me it's, it's a very good one, by the way. So, uh, so you know, the, the thing is, I was telling him, like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, I'm making axonometrics of books. <laughs> I'm, making, I'm making foam core models of books. It's like, is that what you do? I'm like, you know, I'm measuring them, I'm putting them on my table. I, I'm not sure. Um, so I finally at some point realized I needed professional help in, in, in probably more ways than one, and, and we'll talk about that. So, and of course, you know, not to, you know, so these books are like, I'm putting everything in there, damn it. And Eric's, you know, with the additional kind of whiff of a Bible and those, uh, encycl those um, dictionary tabs that kind of go amok and run off the page. I mean, I, I love this as a model. Uh, it's just not what we're going to do. Uh, and, and so in thinking about this, I was, you know, I, I think I wrote in here that, that uh, you know, when I think about my work, I like to try to imagine that I'm a little bit like, you know, the fox and the hedgehog. Um, how does that go? The fox knows a lot of small things and the hedgehog knows one great thing. I always like to imagine we're a little hedgehog-like, that we work on certain few key ideas for a long term uh, over a number of projects, a number, number of years. I put a wall together and I realize it's a bit like a fox as well. There's a kind of relentless interest and novelty in trying sort of new things. And so when I put that wall together, at first it's a little bit thinking like, oh shit, I have no idea. You know, I, I don't know what, what I don't have, I don't think I have an idea about any of this. And so I thought, well, well, so I, I thought, I better turn that into an idea. <laughs> so, um, but, but honestly, I was sort of looking through this work and realized that there is a kind of theme, and, and those of you who know some of the things that we've done uh, in recent years, and I'm showing a kind of trio of projects that I would actually be looking to display together sometime, but especially the thing we did recently for the, the Venice Biennale that was just a couple of blocks here uh, away here at the A&D Museum and, and some of these other things. Some of the studios I've taught recently as well, 
this idea of putting a structure together out of a heterogeneous set of elements. Uh, not clear what we would call it now. I think at some point we were using the, with Jeff Kipnis, the term multiple ontologies. Ontology, I think, that's been taken. We don't, work, we don't use that word anymore, so now. <laughs> What's the other word? A bunch of different stuff put together, uh, including wild shifts of categories of things. And I thought, boy, I think I could actually look at the body of work as something like that. Maybe, maybe rather than it lacking, you know, the it's not Ledoux, right, in, in lots of ways, but it's not that body of work. Rather than it being a misfit of being put into the single book, that maybe the model of this is, is also the model that we can work with here in shorthand. These are some studies. There's an ongoing set of consultations that I've been doing for a large, uh, very large urban project in in Seoul, and so looking at this variety of urban spaces that we put together, this was again this idea that the sense of it is that it's not one thing, that it's a, that it's a whole series of things. And, uh, or even just putting uh, some diagrams together for, for a recent lecture, trying to explain those very projects that I showed as a kind of urban, or sort of the hybrid of an urban architectural idea where it's not the unified thing, it's not the separated thing, uh, and it's not even different things overlaid against the continuous substrate, but it's actually something where there's an oscillation between the substrate, the thing, and, and so it's a high degree of complexity. So this would be, this would be the, the model for it. Going all the way to the other end of that wall, uh, I, I was looking at, and this is where I'll, I'll justify, this is, uh, I'll just show a couple of examples from my thesis. Uh, it was called schizophrenic space, maybe not the term I would use today, but it, I realized this was exactly what, we, what I was working on. Uh, it was at that point looking at the, a model of space that had discontinuities uh, that I think the, the expression uh, at the time was composed as a kind of constellation rather than as a matrix. And so uh, these were looking at models of where, if, if, if let's, I'm mean, just to go back to arguments, I, I won't dwell on this, but looking at models with architecture and the body as a whole thing, then looking at the kind of post-Renaissance disillusion of the body. I, I, I studied a lot and, and copied drawings of, these are a couple of uh, lithographs that were an early part of my thesis, of Andreas Vesalius, the great uh, uh, Renaissance uh, anatomist, who first did the, 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 the detailed dissection of the human body uh, and produced it as a series of beautiful woodcuts for those of you that are in my visual studies class. These are actually lithographs. Uh, but it was really, you know, I, I, I went through and, and studied as all these pieces moved from woodcut to woodcut and started charting the face and the fingers and the hands and how these things would, would, would come apart. And then began to organize uh, these, the, the, the space of the project around this discontinuous constellation. And, and uh, this is, these are just some of the preliminary work leading up to it. Maybe in another occasion, uh, I'll have a chance to present it. And then looking in my bookshelf, I realized, look, even books that are a neat set, like Le Corbusier's Overcomplete, I have an incomplete set, and every one I have is from a different edition in a different format and in a different language. So I thought, why don't I just like, you know, <laughs> much better. So um, somewhere I thought, instead of the monograph, we'll do the polygraph. <laughs> so that was my, that, that bad joke was the product of my sabbatical, thank you. <laughs> I should, uh, uh, and so then it, it was a clarifying moment and so we just started putting everything up on the wall and started putting it together, started going through the archives. Uh, Cody Miner, who you know, who's not only a graduate, but is a, is a young faculty here, has been working with us uh, uh, um, quite a bit on this, helping us put these things together. So we just started putting together what are the kinds of books, what are the formats, what are the, what are the plastic limits of this, how can we put this together. Uh, thinking like some of the work that I've been doing and like the earlier work I'm showing, not simply a discontinuous set of things, but something that at the same time would have precise discontinuities and continuities. It's tough if we're talking about architecture and urbanism, as a lot of you know, I can discuss this at great length and I have a lot of ideas. When it comes to books, not so much. And so this is where I've been uh, getting in, uh, getting my professional help. 
So I do things like I buy this book because, oh. This I don't need. Um, yeah, the form of the book. Book. I thought, oh, there it is. It's just a book about books. I'm going to get this one. And I'm just looking at all these things. And this is a, a fellow, uh, Jan, I'm probably mispronouncing this, Schicholt? Does anyone know? Jan Schicholt? Famous book designer and, and graphic designer, did the Penguin editions for years. He, he did this book in 1991 called The Form of the Book. And he has in there all his rules, 10 common mistakes for producing books. Don't do this, don't do that. Base it on the golden section. It should fit in your hand, all of these things. And so this was a whole symposium of people writing, a, a, a book that was the record of a symposium where people were writing about books and, and talking about it. So I just got it. And especially because there was a discussion of Le Corbusier, all of the books he did, how he broke up amongst various publishers, the most various formats. Sometimes a, for, uh, a font would, uh, stitched together a number of titles, other times it wouldn't. And so it turns out, you know, people have spent time thinking about not just the overcomplete, com how do you say it? L'oeuvre complète? Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you could just, just hit me if I were my French, sorry. Uh, but, but that it was a complicated set of books. Uh, you know, and then in there as well, there was a lot of discussion about Moholinage and the work that he did, um, especially after, after leaving the Bauhaus and, and coming to Chicago, uh, like, such as this book, which I happen to have, Vision in Motion. And the idea was that this was an attempt to explode the format of the book. And it, you could just look at it and look at the images. Texts are arranged differently. Things would jump out at you. Other things would not jump out at you. I, you know, it's a nice book. Uh, it probably lives up to those claims about the same extent that Moholy Naj's artwork lives up to his other claims, which is not so much, uh, but interesting. And you look through this and try to wonder where the, where the model is. Uh, here's some other examples of it. And then uh, just these are, this is, falls into the anecdotes. Uh, having lunch with Harry Cobb recently, who's doing great, by the way. And he tells me, I'm about to have a book come out. I'm having a book coming out this fall. It's called something like uh, Words and Images or Texts and Images. And we're sitting there in a, in a club in New York where you go and have lunch with Harry Cobb. And he goes, we're in the library. And he goes, and it's based on this. And he reaches over behind me and pulls out one of the volumes of Edmund Wilson's uh, memoirs and writings, one of the great men of letters, so-called, of, of the 20th century. Uh, one, each of these cover a separate decade up until the 70s, I think. Turns out this was one of the last ones I put together. But he's saying this one. There's no other book like this until mine comes out. This is based on a golden section, exactly. He was apparently the, the, one of the engines behind the Library of America series. You know, do, you, do you know that one? Which I immediately thought of, but he said, no, nope, that's not a golden section, number one. And number two, you can do this. You can just hold it and flip through it. So this is like all he wanted to talk about was the format of this book, like exactly the size of it, you know? So I thought, so, you know, I, I don't know. I, these are things I pay attention to. You know, he's a, this is a friend of the school. We got one of his models sitting right back there, for God's sake. So that's Harry. Um, and, then, and then so what we did in uh, last, last, at the beginning of last fall is just started, well, if it is this, what, what, does it, what does it consist of? And so this is what we did. We just put together a big old list of everything I could think of, including stuff I had to look up, like vade mecum. Does anyone know that? That's like Latin for like something like take it with you. It's a sort of handy pocket book, so, right? The, the opuscule, that's a minuscule opus. It's like an opus, I have one. It's a minuscule, not exactly an opus, but it's minuscule. That's an opuscule. So we started going, through, and as soon as I started showing these people, they said, what about fanzines? What about, you know? Uh, so so the, the list goes on and on. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes, so this is a book that I've had sitting in the back of my uh, office uh, for a long time. Uh, some of you may know it. I, I would be surprised if we don't have it somewhere back in the office. But in the discussion with Brett Steele, he says, what about that big, giant Mies van der Rohe book? Nobody does that anymore. The big one, this is 18 by 24 inches. This would be called, uh, I think it's an atlas folio. You know, different sizes have different names. This would be the atlas folio. Uh, they're so big and unwieldy that they just 
this one immediately after getting it, I get it gets rained on and, and the cover got damaged. Uh, you know, this is oddly enough, this is uh, an early uh, uh, Andy Warhol's um, interview. We think of it a very, very different and a little bit throwaway, although these go for a lot of money right now. Uh, same size, actually, same size as the Mies Folio, the 18 by 24. So that's, it, it, that's a little bit interesting. And then down to the, you know, the opposite. These very, I, I, do any of you older people remember these from, see, so Coy, you're going to be too old to remember. Ramiro's too young. I mean, David. This is, this is my favorite thing. Instead of reading a book, I would get these little big books. And they just had like every other page was a cartoon and then like two sentences. And the whole book went through like that. And I thought, well, this is a, that's a beautiful format. Why the hell don't people do that anymore? That'll either, I can just one hand will, I don't even need two hands for that one. Um, just, this is just, I've always been obsessed I've always loved the idea of the tipped-in page. They used to do this in the old Abrams art books where the book was printed in one quality and the fine reproductions were printed in another quality and put in. This is not really needed anymore. It's really an anachronism. And because it's a, a perverse anachronism, of course, Jesse and Nanako do that in their book. Uh, and so that's the only book I've seen like in the last 40 years that has tipped-in pages. Uh, but of course, they have a secret message. You lift it up and they tell you underneath. <laughs> the name of the project. So I didn't even realize that until I was taking this picture. Oh, look, there's something underneath there. Um, anyway, the tipped in page. Uh, or the pamphlet, the pamphlet series. Uh, this is great. We all know these. It's a long running series that Stephen Hall started. The amazing thing was this came up in our studio last year, I think. And I thought, oh, shit, that one there with the alphabet, I never got that one. I'm going to look it up. I bet it's really expensive. It's like three bucks. And I asked. <laughs> I asked Kevin McMahon, he goes, no, no, this is, it's not one edition. They just keep printing them for a long time. And so they're completely like not valuable. And so that's, you know, I, that's interesting to me. That's its own, we're gonna do one thing that we, at least one of them we're gonna hope becomes really valuable that we'll, we'll show you. It's collectors, just limited number. Uh, but this one, it turns out, its beauty is it's not. It still is, there's so many of them out there and whenever they would run low, they would just print more. It's never clear what's a first edition, what's a second edition, et cetera. So that's a, that's a great model and, and we know this one and it's cheaply printed. And then sort of think about things that start to extend beyond just what a, a book is. And this is, I don't know, this is just stuff we're looking at. This is the, the Le Corbusier's color book, which I otherwise am dissing during my courses, uh, what his idea about color, decidedly retrograde and, and contrary to our own. Uh, but it is this book that has a series of swatches and little windows that you hold up, et cetera. And so it's a book that's a kind of gizmo, uh, which is interesting. Uh, maybe even further afield, I, I, I have one of these. This is, this is a company in New York. The only reason they're in business is that if you are taking a course from one of Joseph Albers acolytes, then the interaction of color requires you to get one of these things for a, a lot of money. And so this is actually a, a, a kind of satellite offshoot to a book, and it actually just keeps a, a company in business. 314 colors, and anyways. And so we put this together. This is our kind of, all I'm gonna show you today is just kind of where we are. You know, so, of course, uh, this is a very, I, have, I was thinking of a funny story with, with uh, Brendan. McFarland today, because we used to sit next to each other when we were both, I think I was 13 and he was 11 when we were at Morphosis. We were very young. <laughs> and there was a joke, because I had this big stupid, I came out with this big stupid Cadillac from Boston. I came to LA, the only thing I knew about LA was on the map, I had just seen Repo Man, and I thought, I wanna go there. And it was as far as I could get from Boston within the continental United States. And so Baram Shurdell had this big old 1970 Cadillac Fleetwood, an enormous boat. Kept trying to sell it to me and I didn't have any money. Finally, just, just take it. So I came out and I was there, you know, this car. And at some point at lunch, I'm like out with everyone in my car. And then I had like the shocks had gave, given way and there was a bolt, but I didn't have a nut for it. So it would fall down every now and then. And I remember roll out there and I said, okay, I got to put this in. You four, just lift up that end of the car. I'm gonna go underneath and stick. And Brendan thought, this is hilarious. Anyone else in the world would use a jack, but you just figured out the most difficult way, an absurd way possible in the world to do this. And so, just so you know, I thought, you know, what, what I'm gonna do is figure out how to take a book and turn it into a wildly unreasonable and unfinishable <laughs> project. So that's my... Um, 
The good thing is, so we have 11 things now. The good thing is, uh, if it's like this, if it's not a matched set, also no one knows if you don't finish all of them. So this is them, and I do have the list, that's what. Uh, and I'll, but I'll go through them kind of one by one and let you know where they are. They're not actually in any particular order. Uh, number one is notes on representation. Uh, number two is, is uh, Oxruno and Schardell Zago Kipnis. Uh, number three is, is uh, uh, both Andrew Zago, that is before a firm, and Zago architecture from 83 to 96. Number four is furniture. Uh, number five would be the entire period of Detroit work. Uh, number six would be everything I've done since I've come back over the last uh, nine or ten years. Uh, number seven is accident. Uh, number eight is Instagram, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, number nine is an exhibition. Number ten, an exhibition catalog. Number eleven is, is selected writings. This is not, there's two or three things that are fixed, but I realized unless we started making a kind of organization of this, there were just too many uh, moving parts to it. The funny one, the one with an asterisk there, so I, I, I joke about making models with a book, so I had, I had um, uh, breakfast the other day with Lorraine Wilde that I'm sure a lot of you know, and uh, I'm telling her what my idea, and, I, and I just exactly what I told you before, that if it comes to architecture, urbanism, I know the terms of the grid, the background, the foreground, the figure, the object. I just don't know what they are with books. And she just said eight. <laughs> and then she took a piece of paper right from this pad and folded it up in eight. And so that's Lorraine's model of a book, which is in the US, you have a press and they'll fold it into, they'll print it on two sides and they'll fold it up and you have eight. And every eight, you can change what the paper is. You can print one thing on one side, another thing. So there's this whole like, logic that she says, if you just want to know a stru the structure, it's amazing, you know, and sure enough, you start looking through it and you realize, oh yeah, eight, which goes so fundamentally contrary to my idea of prime numbers, I still haven't reconciled the two. So this is, I have the, this inner conflict now, how to reconcile eight, which is the friendliest of all possible numbers, gets along with everyone, uh, and prime numbers, which are quite the opposite. So that one I haven't quite figured out yet. But um, in doing this, uh, I've been working, I, I've been working with, with, uh, with a couple of people on it. Jürgen uh, Malfate, who's a very, so actually, I, I, I'm gonna, the next part goes quickly. How, how, are, how am I doing on time? Halfway through? Halfway, okay. Less, more? A little more than halfway, okay. Um, uh, I had this uh, Joe Day who tells me he's stuck in, he was stuck in traffic coming down from, from Marin and, and, and can't join this evening. But really, when we first put that big board up and we were thinking about it, I had a, um, a, a um, uh, breakfast with Joe in the office and we're talking about things. And we said, well, you don't, you don't need a, a, a graphic designer right now. And I was saying, no, this is probably not a one graphic designer or one publisher problem. He said, you need an art director. And I thought, of course I need an art director. How do I get an art director? And so I'm thinking at lunchtime I go to Alias Books across the street from my office, which is a fantastic bookstore. And then I pick up this book. I'm going to, pardon me again, Dominique. Les Pierres. That's that? The Stones. Is this right? The Stones. And I'm looking at it. And it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful book. It's all these photographs that are clearly taken from advertisements of various jewels. And you could see the dot screen of the printing. It's this kind of art press. And I look at the back, and it's Jurgen Malfate, Le Pierre's uh, edition of 500, Art Papers edition. And so I didn't know anything about this. I just thought, this is great. And I'm one of the, at least one of the things we wanted to do, uh, some of it would, I, I never make claims for the work being art at all, but let's say there's certain art practice qualities of it. And so I thought, I'm going to Google this up. And it turns out uh, Jürgen uh, Melfade, not only was he the author, this art papers edition is his art press, but mostly he's an art director in Belgium. And I thought, oh. And it turns out 
Laura and I were just about to go to Belgium. So I called him up and met, and Jurgen is exactly the guy. So I have a professional on the case, the first of two professionals on the case. Uh, Jurgen's working with us on, on a number of things, but mostly he does, it, I should say art direction. It focuses a lot on print, and he is a graphic designer as well, but it focuses a lot on print, but other media as well. And so it's, it's just great to have someone like that. Uh, the second person is, is Lorraine Wilde. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know who she is. She is one of the high priests of the architecture and art publications. Uh, interestingly enough, at this lunch, she's telling me she's putting together a kind of book on her own work, saying, yeah, it's the same thing. Like, I'll have lunch with some young designer, and they'll tell me, have you ever heard of this book, Mask of Medusa? And she's like, you know, uh, which is hers. Uh, and no, in fact, interesting, her, her, the earliest things she did was uh, as a young intern when she was still uh, maybe just out of Yale or, or a student there, was the intern at uh, Vignelli's office when their unpaid project that he was interested in because of its street cred was doing everything for Peter Eisenman. And so no, it, they weren't getting paid. And so Lorraine actually is the one who put together all of the oppositions books and, and things like that and the morphosis monographs, et cetera. Uh, I think has has an educated uh, uh, you know an entire generation of people. So when it comes to the book, the book, the book, she she knows that, and and so um, it, it and how great to have uh, um, both of these people uh, working with me. So the first one notes these are not in order. This one is is something that I'm talking to. Uh, in fact, we're trying to figure out the exact content of this, and this is something that I'm definitely working with Lorraine on to put the content together. This is where the discussion of the big Mies book uh, uh, comes out. And for those of you that, that don't know this, this is from drawings in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. It is, I mean, the, the way I would describe it is sort of gorgeous. It's, it's thick, it's beautifully printed, it's unreasonably large. She said, oh, my, same thing, my copy's damaged. They're so damn big, you can't just keep them from getting you know, torn or rained on or something. Uh, and so, um, you know, I told her, I, I, I don't know what exactly, we had put together a series of very large boards for the Art Institute in Chicago in connection with an exhibition of these films, but I thought, look, I'd, I'd like to work with you on all of this work and something that wouldn't be project specific, but would just be dealing with large things that have a certain kind of physical and visual presence, we would like to just do a big book that I just want to have. And, and she was saying, oddly enough, thinking through the problem and knowing that book well, she thought, you know what, this is actually easier today with digital printing than it would have been then in varying quantities. And so this is something that, let's say, uh, we're over the next few weeks, we're going to put a kind of prospectus together uh, and we're going to determine the, the content of. Uh, the second one is one that I'm, I'm working with, with Jeff on. This is uh, you know, Oxruno, and then it's kind of offshoot as Schardel Zago Kipnis. I'd like what we're trying very much to see, if anyone's interested, if we could kind of get someone to take this on as a project. Um, it's, it's a partnership rather than uh, just myself alone, and, and it's, um, uh, at this point, it's kind of historic, I guess. It's something a lot of people have asked me about. Uh, people doing PhDs are asking me about it. So it's 87 to 91, and so this on the board, it's, it's a dozen or so projects, including some, some graphics uh, and posters that were done. And so, and there was various kinds of short essays that were written at the time by ourselves, uh, including Jeff. And so this is something that uh, also Lorraine is gonna be the graphic designer of. She's oddly enough a person who knows all three of us, she and Baram uh, used to teach together at, at Houston before they both came out here to LA. So that's, that's kind of its own thing. Uh, the next one, as I mentioned, is, is uh, it, it's juvenilia, so kind of things that would fall in the category of excruciatingly drawn and quite abstract drawings. Uh, that I'm, I, don't, I don't think of it as student work. This was work when I was working quite closely with, with uh, Baram Shardell. I think of it as the kind of first work of my professional life. So that up until, let's say, taking out Morphosis and Oxruno, and then continuing when I went on, with, on my own, ending with my first built project, which is a design studio for the engineering school at, at Cornell University. So that's that window. These aren't, I'm just, this is just, just telling you. 
I don't have any a point to a lot of these. Uh, and then uh, one of the outtakes, and there could be others, is chair and, and other furniture. And, and I think uh, a lot of you may know we have two chairs with funny names. Uh, Boing, which is the one on the top left. And then the one next to it, the kind of ready-to-wear version, which is the Zagzig. Uh, and then there's a couple of other different versions of tables that are based on these kinds of, actually on prime numbers, these non-recursive series um, that turn into uh, these, these kind of end tables made of recycled lumber. We've put together kind of furniture brochures for these, um, but, but I've also done, and in fact, I think I talked about this at length last time I did give an evening lecture here. You know, we tend to go deep on disciplinary research on these projects, and, and we certainly did it uh, with this one, and we, we investigated the 20th century chair find that the history of it is largely shaped by architects or people that are in part architects, and that there were certain breakthroughs in terms of the cantilever, and we thought we discovered other ones, and so this, this, this could be, you know, have those things. Uh, Jurgen is, is proposing, these, these are the two that would be most monograph-like, which is um, current work and the work right before that. I think each of them hang together. The Detroit stuff has a certain kind of doom and gloom. In fact, I think the installation that I did here, uh, the very first one in the gallery, Cypher, 2002, 2003, that was dark and that was really a kind of Detroit project. I think the things here that I've, we've done since we've been here are, are different. So they make sense, even though we're trying to avoid chronology. I think within each one, they're different. Jurgen really thought they shouldn't be two books, or maybe that they're two halves of one book or something. And so, you know, here's an interesting model. Stephen Hall did this recently with Lars Mueller. It's the identical size, just one book is 90 degrees to the other, which is hilarious because you can't put it neatly on your shelf, like the overcomplete one is not showing or the other one isn't. Uh, maybe a little too tidy for me. I, I, I was recently at the Graham Foundation, which has developed an incredible bookstore, by the way. Uh, and I just saw this. Uh, it's just, a, it's not a terribly interesting book, but here's two books. Here's a book, two volumes, same title, same author, same publisher, completely different sizes and slightly different formats. Um, and then this one, uh, on this very curtain, uh, a number of years ago, there was a slideshow going of accidents. I, I remember much to uh, uh, Kevin's dismay because a lot of them, this stock image, this is not, I think they were like when you order on Amazon. It's not the actual cover, although. Um, the, the, uh, so we had done, it was, I had put together a, a show for a conference on, in, in Princeton that Ed Eigen organized on accident, but it was also the subject of some visual studies classes I had done here. And this was a, a, a kind of cavalcade of accidents, we called it. It was 250 images, one after another, very carefully choreographed. Uh, Sarah Blankenbaker, who was a graduate from here and, and I worked with closely, she was really the main choreographer of these, of these uh, images, but they were shown like that. Um, at this conference, it was up here for several weeks as a kind of rotating slideshow. Uh, but this is, a, it's been sitting around as a book for a long time. Ed Eigen, as it turns out, just I think in a week or two at, at uh, Cynthia's, uh, Davidson's pop-up space in, in New York is going to be having a book launch for his essays on accident. So w in discussion with Jurgen, this is happening very, very quickly. This is going to come out with his art papers edition. In fact, he's got it. This is... Uh, it is in the spirit of this book. It's already showing up as coming soon. Although he kept our artwork, it's not the that's still a stock image up there on the top. Uh, but this is this is uh, in production right now. I would hope uh, before the end of the semester that this book is out. This is going to be. It is it is a kind of it is a limited edition art book. Is the, the least kind of monograph the, of them all. But I think um, the timing is right, and and it's just kind of sitting there. Uh, so coming soon to a bookstore near you. Um, and then one that's finished, and this is really just a byproduct of, of um, in putting this, uh, uh, Cody is also our social media director, by the way, which is, it's, let me tell you, if you want a well-paid job, social media director at Zago Architecture. Is a <laughs> <laughs> the, this is really a byproduct of going through and putting together everything that, we, as we were going through the archives and enumerating what these 101 things are, all it was, it was just like a little project. It was a different project every single day for 101 days. 
and that's it. We did it, and we stopped, and these are just, I would try to take milestone screenshots with, with each hundred. We stopped a little while ago, although we keep getting people signs, it's about to hit 2,000, which I realize on Instagram is a, a trivial, trivial amount, but no tricks. No, none of those like special sites to get a bunch of extra people on there. I know those of you out there who did it. <laughs> You're not fooling me. This is grassroots, this 2,000. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so that one's done. Uh, the, uh, and then two that are really far out, uh, just I'm, I'm putting out there. One is um, uh, an exhibition, uh, which would be, as I was talking with Jurgen, maybe kind of the end, not just an exhibition of our work, but probably it would be the only thing that would ac actually use the term polygraph. None of this is a, just our kind of working title. Maybe an exhibition would, and you know, this is um, the show that was here that's now in, in New York. This has a lot of that work um, from these various periods, uh, from um, I think from 87 or 88 through some fairly new stuff in mixed with a lot of stuff. So it's not this, this would be more like, here's, these are aspirational images, a lot of you may know this, this is a, a installation view of Gerhard Richter's Atlas project, but this is really a kind of compendium, sort of single-minded uh, and, and going through it. And then kind of the very last bit of it would be um, an exhibition catalog that goes with it. This is very curious, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you know this book. It's, you know, this is actually sort of the opposite. Atlas is an exhaustive compendium of every goddamn thing that uh, 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 um, Gerhard Richter looks at and has in his studio, page after page after page. So really, the, it's really the exhibition is an exhibition of the catalog rather than the catalog being a catalog of the exhibition. So it gets a little bit into a kind of hall of mirrors, but nonetheless, that's it. And the last one, which I say will be a thin volume, is the collected writings, and, and this will be, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at models of this. This is one, although there's two different thoughts. One is without pictures, and one is with pictures, and this is what we're, we're trying. Obviously, with pictures, it gets a lot fatter, and so looking at sort of fun, fun books that I like that have, um, that are just texts. Uh, but then there is this whole other category of things which we work on obsessively in lots of different formats, which is diagrams. We diagram a lot, and as you see at the beginning, we're even starting to diagram the polygraph itself, a kind of meta-diagram of it. And so if it includes diagrams, it, it may well, these are pages from that big little, aren't these like amazing graphics in these? Is there, anyways, these are, I actually got two of them at a flea market of these Tarzan books, and one I just tore apart and scanned just because I wanted these images. Um, and uh, so it could be that it has these kinds of images, uh, or, or, you know, this is, I don't know, I just throw this in here. I, I came across this great book of punk posters and then realized that, you know, this is, uh, so this is funny that I was with a number of students in, in Chicago. We went to UIC and, and Bob was there and talking with us. And they're like, well, it must be odd that it's like, you know, the main text he's known for is this really short one. And I'm like, that's just at SciArc where we don't read enough. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're in a lot of other stuff. But for me though, you know, the idea that you could have a really important article that falls onto two pages and the graphics start to drown it out is compelling to me. Uh, or, or these, this is a, um, um, uh, these, uh, it's a, a couple of the Perlmans out of Detroit. These guys have been, they, they were the, it, it's the, the black and red press. This is like an anarchist press in Detroit that started in the, early 60s, they were the first ones to do the US translation of Guy Debord, the Society of the Spectacle, and all of their, this is some of their things. These are friends of actually uh, Laura's parents. They, they play cello, the cellists. Freddie Perlman, who recently uh, died, and, and his wife Lorraine is the, the violinist. So they all have like uh, Karl Marx on there. So I thought, you know, maybe I could have, that, that's, you know, I'll get them to print these, that'll be nice. Uh, more or less the end. Thank you. <laughs>